Hi. A couple of months ago, one of my kids came to me with the iPad. And I said, oh, what are you doing? He said, I'm playing the newest game from Angry Birds. It's a car racing game. I said, oh, wow, let me see that. And I looked, and I saw something, and I said, do most apps have $99 in-app purchases for, for kids' games? And he said, yeah, I've seen those before. And he took me to another app, and then another app where we saw these just what, to me, seemed to be gigantic and unimaginable in-app purchases in games for kids. And these weren't explicitly games for kids, but they were games that a lot of kids like to play. So that got me thinking, what, you know, what's going on? We're, we're making money as app developers, or other app developers are making money, by setting things up that, that as you probably heard, gets us in trouble and, and led to a big ruling against Apple that we just saw where Apple had to do some reimbursement of people for their in-app purchases. So there are a lot of other things that you see when you um, sit on Twitter as much as I do and watch the conversations that are going on. And a lot of them have to do with different people's views about morality and ethics. So I thought that it would be worth squeezing another session into the conference to talk about this with someone that I discovered as I was just searching around on the internet for resources. The resource that I found was a course on ethics for software developers that a uh, professor at Santa Clara University, Shannon Valor, has created. Shannon is an associate professor of philosophy at Santa Clara University, uh, just down the road. She's, um, uh, she's appointed at the Markula Center of Applied Ethics. Um, Markula is a name you would know if you were at the Mac 30th celebration last, last weekend. So I asked her to come and was really fortunate to find that she could make room on her schedule and come and talk to us. So I want to introduce her now, Shannon Valor, and we're going to have a conversation about ethics for app developers. Thank you. We got a live mic. Everyone hear me? OK, good. And I um, just need the projector to Oh, well, that'll do it. OK, um, so my involvement in this issue has grown over the course of a couple of years. I teach the philosophy of technology, philosophy of science, and also a course called Science, Technology, and Society that deals largely with the social and ethical implications of emerging technologies. And my students responded so positively to that course that my own research began to uh, turn more in this direction. And I began writing on the ethics of social media, uh, the ethics of emerging uh, military technology, uh, automated systems, uh, uh, drones, and so on. And um, increasingly, I began to realize that as an academic, uh, I have a very limited impact unless I am able to engage uh, with the communities outside of academia that are actually doing the relevant work and rolling out the relevant technologies. And this is a, an incredibly exciting challenge, but a difficult challenge for an academic to reach those audiences. And one uh, conversation that I had uh, last year with uh, Irina Raiku, who is the Internet Ethics Program Manager at the Markula Center for Applied Ethics, and she's here with me today. If you want to wave in the corner there, Irina. Um, she uh, came to Santa Clara and uh, to the Markula Center and started talking with me about the gap in undergraduate engineering ethics education for computer science and software engineering majors. And the difficulty of finding room in a curriculum uh, and, and overcoming the resistance and fear, I think, of a lot of faculty to introducing this material in their courses when they may feel like they don't have room in the course or they may feel that they aren't uh, sufficiently uh, uh, experts themselves on whatever software engineering ethics is. So we decided that we would make uh, a first foray into filling this gap at least uh, the tiniest bit uh, with a downloadable free module 
uh, teaching module, an introduction to software engineering ethics that we would make available on the Markala Center site for anyone around the world to download and use for free uh, with some survey questions at the end to give us feedback so that we could keep improving it. And uh, because of some connections between the Markala Center and uh, Arvind Narayanan, who is a computer scientist at Princeton University, and some of you may know uh, of, of his work with Do Not Track and so on, we, we decided that we would build this and roll it out and see what the response would be. And Arvind uh, uh, co-wrote the introduction of the module with me, and um, there's Irina's uh, bio right there, and Arvind's uh, right here. He is the world's most wired computer scientist, according to Wired Magazine, so uh, that's what I call him. So. Um, we, we actually got a very interesting response. So first thing that happened is that uh, Pacific Standard Magazine uh, wanted to write a story about the module. And, uh, and this was also picked up by, by Slate as well. Um, and then more recently, um, the uh, Association of Computing Machinery, the uh, ACM, asked uh, Arvind and I to write a column uh, about uh, software engineering ethics education uh, for, for their communications. And that's going to come out in March right there. That's just a proof. Um, right now, the modules being used, uh, the numbers may have gone up uh, since I last heard, but uh, my current understanding is that it's being used in 17 different universities on three different continents. And the modules intended to be a, a short few days inserted into uh, a, a course uh, that might otherwise not have any ethics content. So uh, this is the uh, chain of activities that led me uh, to, uh, to be uh, on the internet as someone who can talk about these things so that Tim could find me and bring me here. So I'm really excited to be here and, and I hope that we can have a good conversation about, uh, about these issues. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about software engineering and developer ethics. I realize that these are uh, somewhat distinct but overlapping issues. And I want to talk about them, first of all, in two ways. First, as a form of professional ethics, and secondly, as a form of personal ethics. And these are mutually reinforcing ways of thinking about software and ethics. So let's start with professional ethics. So first of all, why do professions involve ethical duties? Well, Ethical duties in professions are connected to the very thing that makes something a profession. And there's a lot of debate about whether software development or software engineering really is a profession. Uh, a lot of developers don't tend to think of themselves as belonging to a profession, uh, which carries connotations of a very sort of institutionalized, uh, formal uh, system of, of work uh, that might not match up with sort of the freewheeling culture and, uh, and uh, creativity of the software engineering environment and the software development environment. But it is a profession and I'm gonna explain why. All professions, so think of the classic examples, the legal profession, the medical profession, the teaching profession, the military profession, we could list many more. All professions secure important public goods, goods that are necessary for a good life. Goods that belong not just to individuals, but to the public as a whole. The kinds of goods that are required for any community to flourish, any human community anyway. So uh, the kind of goods I'm thinking of, uh, corresponding to the professions I've named, uh, justice, health, knowledge, security, this entails a moral responsibility to the public. Because if you are providing or securing those goods that the community needs in order to flourish, then you have an inherent intrinsic moral responsibility to secure those goods responsibly and in a way that takes the public welfare into account. And this is why ethics is such an important and central part and a formally accepted part of medical practice, of legal practice, of military practice, of academic practice, and so on. Now here's the key point. Today, all of these public goods flow through channels designed, built, and maintained by software engineers and developers. 
So it's not just that you are one profession among many. Software and those involved with the uh, life of the internet are increasingly the channel through which all public goods flow. It's not the only way these goods can be accessed, but increasingly it is the way that people seek to find the things in life that they need to flourish. And then we have other public goods flowing through the channels that you guys built that normally uh, would flow uh, through other channels, privacy, wealth, and social capital. It's a term that sociologists use quite frequently to talk about the power of social connections and the way that those can be seen as a form of, of wealth. So you in this room have your hands and your tools have a grip on all the kinds of public goods that people count on in order to live well. That's where the moral responsibility comes from. And that's where the professional status comes from. So what are professional ethics? They show us how general moral standards, such as integrity, honesty, courage, wisdom, care, and so on, they show us how these things look when applied to the specific context in which we work. And that's really important. Because just having someone tell you, be honest, isn't that helpful if you don't know what honesty looks like in the context of developing software, or what integrity looks like in the context of disclosing information to your users about what's being collected in terms of their personal data, right? So professional ethics is a way of taking the general moral standards that we all have to live up to and showing each other how those standards actually manifest themselves in our daily professional life. OK, but it's also important to think about this form of ethics as a personal ethic. Work is a core part of our moral lives and character. Some of us try to compartmentalize it, set it aside from our identities as parents or siblings or spouses uh, or friends. But really, considering how many hours we all spend working compared with the hours we spend doing other things, there's probably nothing more central uh, to who we are in the, in the modern contemporary era than our work. So it is a personal ethics because you cannot separate the work from the person. Now, there's a basic moral norm, which I won't claim is a universal one, because any philosopher who claims that something is a universal moral norm just might as well paint a big target on her chest. Uh, but, but a basic and quite common moral norm is the desire to make an honest living, which is just a sort of metaphor for a way of life that is fundamentally ethical, a professional way of life that's fundamentally ethical. Um, we might compare this, for example, uh, with the explicit uh, concept of right livelihood in Buddhism, but there are more sort of tacit notions of uh, being ethical in your work as something that also allows you to be ethical as a person. All of us hope that our children and parents and so on will always be proud rather than ashamed when they describe what we do, right? So this is part of our identity, our self-image as moral people. Also, and this is very important, personal ethics help us to think through work situations for which our professional codes of ethics have not prepared us, right? Life always brings with it unforeseen and sometimes unforeseeable ethical challenges, novel situations that the standards that we have evolved as professionals might not have caught up to. And personal ethics is what ensures that we are in the habit of thinking about how to respond to those kinds of unprecedented situations in ethical ways, so that we're not just relying on a formal set of memorized rules or practices uh, that might create blind spots where ethical responsibilities exist. Also, uh, personal ethics help us to integrate the different aspects of our character, roles, and self-image, to be a whole person as opposed to a fragmented one. OK, I want to talk a little bit about uh, ethics and society in the context of software. So, Philosophers will tell you that ethics is fundamentally about the good life. That's, that's the nutshell, right? And we can get into a lot of abstract theory about what that amounts to, but ultimately what we're talking about is what is it to live well? What is it to flourish? Now, software developers 
and people who market software sell a particular image of the good life. And you guys know all the buzzwords that are being used to sell that image right now. The good life is mobile, it's social, it's smart, it's shareable, it's trackable, it's on demand. Fill in whatever buzzwords you like that I've left out. If developers fail to think about ethics, that is whether their products are actually good for users and for society, if they actually promote the good life, if they fail to think about that question, this image will come to be seen as unattractive, a, a marketing lie or mere gimmick, as opposed to a meaningful promise of something worth having. And it's important to remember and it's especially important to remember now when the software industry is really um, sort of coming into its own and really seems indispensable to the way we live. Okay? It's important at exactly that moment to remember that no industry is immune from the ethical judgments of the society of which it is a part. I want you to think about the reputation and image of tobacco companies and tobacco ads and, and products. Consider the difference between how those companies and their products were seen and the people whose professions were, were tied to these products. Consider the difference between the 1950s and the 1980s when the tide really started to turn and today. So something that can be seen as central to the good life or to our own self-image can come to be seen as pernicious and poisonous, especially if it comes to be perceived that the people involved in developing and selling that product don't care whether their users flourish and thrive or whether they suffer and are victimized. And I probably don't need to make note here of the Google bus protests in the city, the way that urban tech workers have been demonized in certain corners of the media in recent months. And there really is not reason to panic, but reason to at least perk up our ears and be concerned about whether there's a certain canary in the coal mine sign here that the public is not fully convinced that this industry is sincerely concerned for their welfare and interested in promoting the good life. And remember also that tech consumers are notoriously fickle. Above all kinds of consumers, tech consumers demand products that they believe help them to live well and they reject those that for whatever reason do not. So think of the teen Facebook exodus when people recognize that they don't really want mom and dad to have access to their updates. And then I want to just emphasize that people want to live in an ethical world. Even dishonest, antisocial narcissists want the world around them to be honest and attentive to their needs. So you really have to ask yourself, you can be as cynical as you like about whether the, your users are ethical, whether your coworkers are ethical, whether anyone is ethical. It doesn't matter if anyone is, everyone wants an ethical world and they want the products they use to be designed by people who are attentive to their needs and concerned for their welfare. So you still have to ask yourself, no matter how cynical you are, are your apps shaping a world that people will want to live in? Let me say a few things about apps and ethics. Uh, often, uh, depending upon the size of your enterprise, there may be fewer fail-safes or levels of oversight than you would find in other engineering contexts. So code may be deployed without a great deal of institutional review, which places more responsibility on those who do get their hands on it to make sure that uh, that due diligence is taken. Also, developers are often in the best position to know how the technology may be affecting users. Ethical reflection can't just be handed off to ethics specialists. Engineers have to stay in the loop. The people who know the software and know the code have to be involved, whether it's what they want to be involved in or not. Also, remember that apps are a moving ethical target. Features change, users change, platforms change, context change. A benign app can be ethically problematic with a single bug fix or update. That's been pointed out in some of the talks that we've already seen today. 
Also, ethical issues in general cannot be fully anticipated. Ethics is about responsiveness, not just foresight and prediction. So the fact that you didn't see a problem or even couldn't have seen a problem coming doesn't mean that you don't have an ethical responsibility to respond to it quickly, wisely, appropriately. Also remember, ethics is not the same thing as legal compliance. Ethics isn't law and it isn't compliance. They are related, they often overlap. One could argue that law is a formal way of representing ethical uh, uh, considerations that we uh, take to be enduring and of a certain level of significance. But it, it doesn't replace ethics. Ethics is broader than law. And ethics is something that is pervasive and, and constant. It doesn't go away. You can't just check off a box with the compliance mindset and forget about it. You can't just write something into a terms of service agreement and then forget about it. So ethics is about a constant mindset of responsibility to those who are affected by the things that you make and the things that you do. There's another reason why ethics can't be confused with law. Laws are slow. Laws have to respond after the fact, and they can only, they can only come about after a certain amount of public deliberation has taken place, which is a good thing, right? We wouldn't want laws to be just made on the fly. But there are times when an ethical situation, a crisis comes about, and we have to respond before there's a law that tells us how to do it. And so ethics is required in order to be able to respond appropriately to situations for which the law has not caught up. So ethics then is a cultivated habit of thinking and acting. It's not a set of rules. It's not a checklist. All right, so let's uh, think about some questions about ethics and app, develop app development. Now these questions, uh, there are five of them, and they came from Tim Burks, uh, 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 to whom I'm very grateful, because I think these were fantastic questions, and they really helped me think about what I could say to you uh, that would stimulate a good conversation. So I'm gonna go through some of my preliminary answers to these questions, but I hope that in the Q&A period, uh, we can go a little bit deeper. So here's one question, the first question that Tim sent me. How can an app maker set appropriate limits on the amount and kinds of information collected about users? <clears throat> Some of what I'm going to say uh, has already been addressed uh, uh, by the, the prior two presentations, uh, but, but I'm just going to look at it from an ethical point of view. Well, first, by asking the very question, as opposed to taking the approach of, well, let's just collect and store everything in case we need it later, right? And, and we know that that's a tempting strategy. So even just recognizing that this question always has to be asked and seriously examined uh, is, is essential. Consider user expectations. Actual, ordinary users, not ideally knowledgeable, prudent users, not users who know what you know. And that was emphasized in Laura Berger's talk earlier as well. Consider questions of context. Why is this information being collected? Who is it being collected for? How might it get used? Context really matters. Uh, Helen Nissenbaum has written a, a lot about privacy and the notion of contextual integrity, uh, pointing out that norms of privacy shift according to the context that people are in and, and what expectations are operative in that context. So you have to have a flexible, thoughtful approach to this that recognizes the contextual factors. Consider potential harms. Who could this information hurt? How seriously, right? A minor annoyance or inconvenience technically is a harm, but it's not one that necessarily has to change our practices uh, if there's a, a significant uh, penalty to be paid for doing that. Uh, but there are kinds of harms that we have to sacrifice our own convenience for. So, Thinking about harms and understanding the range of possible harms is really important. And again, this is, has to be a habit, something we just start doing automatically. And consider third parties. This has been made clear by uh, the last couple of presentations, also the, 
scandal about leaky apps and the NSA that came out in the last week, right? So it's not enough for you to feel that you're a good actor, that you're a, a, a benign agent or that your company is a benign agent. You have to think about others who could be indirectly affected, by the way. So not just the user, but people associated with the user who might be affected by the information that the user is disclosing. Also think about third parties who might gain or purchase access to the information later. So these are the sorts of things that have to be considered before you can decide what an appropriate limit is. Okay, here's a second question. If an app can make money by appealing to people's natural tendencies and desires, why limit that? Well, most of the time you wouldn't want to, right? I mean, isn't that part of good design? Is thinking about what your users want, what their natural tendencies are, and how you can gear into those. But it's important to avoid what philosophers call either the appeal to nature or sometimes the naturalistic fallacy, right? Natural does not equal good. Also, legal does not equal good, right? Made that point earlier. But this naturalistic fallacy or this appeal to nature is something that's far too easy to fall into, to think, well, I'm just giving the user what they naturally desire, and therefore there can't be anything wrong uh, with what I'm doing. Now here's a rather stark example, um, but look, meth dealers appeal to humans' natural desires. If meth were legalized tomorrow, would selling it be an ethical way to make a living? Okay, we all know it wouldn't. Now, that's not to say that any of you here are selling the digital equivalent of meth. But the point is, is that simply relying on the fact that you're appealing to your users' natures doesn't get you very far in terms of, uh, in terms of ethical justification. So here's the question you should be asking. Not is it natural, but is it contributing to human flourishing? This is a, a term that philosophers use in, in, when they talk about uh, Aristotelian virtue ethics, but it's a term that anyone can understand. We all know what it is to flourish. And it's important that flourishing is a time-extended notion, right? It's not just, I feel good right now. I feel good right now, I'm happy right now is not flourishing. Flourishing is, I am getting something that will be of enduring value for a good life. It will allow me to continue to exist in a way that is healthy, happy, satisfying, and so on. All right, third question. If people are left out of my audience because they can't afford the equipment and services that are necessary to access uh, my, my app, is that my problem? Well, it depends. By the way, the answer to most ethical questions that are formed in any abstract way is it depends. So get used to that. Get comfortable with it. Embrace that it depends. Okay, how critical or basic are the goods that your app provides? This is an important question, right? Not everything that's available is something that is essential to a good life. Are these goods uh, that your audience can't reach, or, or that or people outside your audience rather can't reach, uh, are they accessible by other more affordable means? Are any measures being taken to expand the affordability of your product, right? Are you making a cheaper version of it? Or are you uh, contributing to other efforts of third parties to make these goods accessible? And does the unequal access magnify existing social and economic inequalities? Or does it contribute to the further marginalization of those without access? The answers to these questions make a significant amount of difference. They fill out the it depends part. If other people, here's the fourth question, aren't making apps because they lack the background and opportunity, why shouldn't I profit from my advantage? So we know that there's a lot of debate going on right now about whether the developer community is sufficiently diverse, whether it's sufficiently welcoming, and so on. All right, so here's some things to think about. You can profit from an unearned advantage in general without choosing to perpetuate it. So here's some questions you can ask yourself when you think about whether you're choosing to perpetuate this advantage. Are you making the participation of others easier or are you making it more difficult? 
Here's some things to think about in connection with that. Who do you choose to mentor? Who do you encourage to enter the field? How do you treat new developers who come with backgrounds that are different from yours or different from the standard profile of a software developer? The answers to these questions can help to tell you whether you are perpetuating an unearned advantage or not. Fifth question, if I'm developing apps on a platform belonging to a big company, can I be blamed for its actions? Okay, you can be blamed for anything. Let's just, you know this, right? Now, whether you earned the blame is a separate question in principle, but you all know that that's not always the case in practice. So think about that. It's not enough to, to, to just rest comfortably with the notion that your conscience is clear. Right? That doesn't mean that there isn't uh, something that you will be blamed for. So ask yourself, did you consciously or negligently enable those actions of the big company? Could you have reasonably foreseen them? Did you take any available steps to prevent them? And even if you couldn't have foreseen them or prevented them, did you respond once you became aware of them? Right? Did you communicate any ethical concerns up the corporate chain before, during, or after? Did you take any other steps to mitigate the problem? OK, so these were the questions that Tim asked me. These are some preliminary thoughts I have. And I'd like to add to these just, OK, so here's the questions once again. I can, I'll, I'll work back and put these back up uh, when I'm done. But I want to just briefly end with some final thoughts or questions for you guys. What are the greatest obstacles to ethical app development from your perspective? I want to know that. Knowing the answers to those questions helps me do my job better. So th these are all selfish questions. What useful parallels or important differences exist between software engineering and development ethics and more robust, ingrained cultures of professional ethics like we would find in the medical, legal, academic research, or military professions? Where are these similar and where are they dissimilar? How much of a parallel should we want to draw between them? I'd like to know what changes to engineering education would be most effective in building a more robust culture of software engineering and development ethics. This is something I'm actively involved in. I teach a graduate ethics course to engineers, uh, and I'd like, to, I'd like to make sure that it's doing the job. And then finally, what can trained ethicists do to better engage the software community? Where are we falling short, or where could we do more to be helpful to the community in this regard? Those are my questions for you. I hope you'll have at least a, a few thoughts about that. Um, so, but that's where I'll draw to a close. Uh, you can reach me at these uh, at particular locations. I'd love to hear from you. We'll do at least three. Hey, thanks so much, and thanks for raising this issue. Um, my name is Torsten Hauser. I run an app development business, and I'm creating games for more than 20 years. What happened in the last two years is the App Store economy and the App Store even for, for iOS has completely turned into a casino. So if you look at the top grossing apps that we have at the moment, um, it's apps that are actually financed by gambling addicts. Okay? So if you look at Cash of Clans, at Candy Crush Saga, any of these games, they make more than 50% of their turnover by 3% of the people. Mm -hmm. These are people that spending, are spending hundreds of dollars every month, and it's not rich people, it's poor people. I mean, I'm at the moment in our games industry, I need to manipulate my players to buy inner purchases. I'm not, I'm not able to create entertainment anymore to please people, but to be successful in the App Store at the moment, there's no way around it. And most indie developers, many great people, have actually given up because they refuse to get evil. Um, I think one of the th uh, most uh, things that really make me feel bad is all these games are allowed for children of four, the ages of four and up. So we're really manipulating children into the system. And I think that's, that's pretty um, bad. 
um, most people I know in the industry, and will be at the Casual Games Conference in Amsterdam next week, they have a background in the casino industry. And they're like, oh no, it's not gambling, it's gaming. And, <laughs> yeah, and I think we have a pretty bad situation here at the moment. I don't think that anyone will come up with their ethics by themselves. Yeah. And I do believe that is a case where we do need a government ruling or something like, yeah. like that. I will be at Apple tomorrow raising exactly the same issue. Thank you. So one specific thing also that got me thinking about ethics was um, a friend of mine told me, hey, there's this great system for getting users to make in-app purchases. It's so good that it was made illegal in Japan. So, <laughs> so I'll tweet information about that later. It's called Kampu Gacha, and it's, um, it's a very interesting thing that was done, and it worked really well, and then the Japanese government decided it was just, it had to be made illegal. So I, ha I saw, the first hands I saw were here and here, and then we'll go. Do you, do you want, may I respond to that briefly, or do you want me to say? Yes, go ahead. Okay. So, uh, I mean, I, I'm really glad that you raised this point, and I think a couple of things I would say. There are cases where, yeah, the regulation is needed in order to step in. Individual developers cannot uh, overcome some of, these, uh, some of these problems. The question I think that uh, people need to ask themselves is, what am I doing to join up with others and give voice to our problems with, with what we're seeing. And are we encouraging, like you said, you're going to Apple to raise that issue. The very fact that you're raising the issue is doing something to try to uh, build some uh, response about this. So are you trying to, uh, to raise the profile of this problem? Are you trying to bring it to the attention of the people who can do something about it? And are you continuing to try? Or are you saying, well, I tried, but nobody listened, so I gave up, and I'm just going to go back and and, and uh, feed, my, feed my addicts. Uh, I guess my comment is now kind of related. Um, what role do you see um, professional, professional licensing playing in ethics? Um, as an example, my sister's a mechanical engineer. She, is it what? I'm sorry? My, my sister's a mechanical engineer. Yes. So as part of her education, she went through the process. She got her PE, and she is now, you know, she has a, a, li a license, essentially. My, in my field in software, we didn't even have a process. Software seems to not even know how to approach that issue. Yeah. Would it help if we did? I, I think it might, if done the right way. I, I, I realize there's a lot of resistance in the community uh, to those sorts of uh, high-level controls on the profession. Um, so the question would be, how could we set up that sort of structure in a way that would actually preserve what works? about the software developer community. But there are some things that we can think about, like continuing education requirements that include ethics education, and that and can help, because see, I can teach ethics to undergraduates. A, they're gonna forget it unless it's actually a part of their professional practice. B, when I teach them at the university level, they don't yet know how to apply it in, in the professional setting. They actually have to learn that from other people they're working with, from peers. And the issues that I raise when they are engineering students are not the issues necessarily that they're gonna be confronting five years later when they're in the field, or even a year later. So I think continuing ethics education in the profession as a requirement is maybe one step towards putting those kinds of, uh, w whether it should proceed all the way to a sort of formal licensing requirement, I I'm not sure, but uh, it it's something worth thinking about. Uh, so traditionally, professions are granted certain rights by the community. So lawyers and doctors, for example, have monopolies on those particular professions. Uh, educators traditionally have tenure. Um, so if we're going to be professionals, what, what are our special rights? That's a great question. And I think that has to be addressed side by side with the question about licensing, right? So one of the ways that profession, professionals are protected is by having something like licensure or tenure, some sort of status that cannot simply be uh, taken uh, by another without meeting certain requirements. So um, that would be the question of how can we put uh, requirements in place that also benefit uh, developers and give the best people in the profession uh, some form of support. Um, I need to throw a little thorn in the works for this Please discussion do. about profession. A lot of us are into 
educational apps, we're trying to teach little kids that they can learn to program and make an app. Every man can make an app given you know, an appropriate accessible tool. Sure. That's very different from the education you need to build a bridge or a medical device or an aeronautical wing. So how does that correspond you know, with sure. uh, delivering professional ethics when we're trying to teach this to kids? Well, here's the, what I would say. I mean, you, certainly you can teach a 12-year-old to design an app. Can you teach a 12-year-old to, uh, to implement and roll out uh, and maintain an app responsibly? No, you can't. Because 12-year-olds aren't full-grown ethical agents. So uh, I think we have to make a distinction between the skills that it takes to create an app and the skills that it takes to actually roll it out and, and deliver it to the public in a responsible way. So I think it's fine to teach the skills, as long as we don't assume that that makes you a developer in the full-blown sense. Well, I guess I, my question is sort of a side issue about how we teach engineers about the maybe unintended side effects of software we release. Um, if we look at sort of the NSA issues going on and how software we all release is used, many of our licenses like MIT, the MIT license, Apache license are sort of free-for-alls. You can do anything you want with software. And having been in the financial space and also be previous in academia, seeing some of my own software get into things that I never thought that should be in, weapon systems for example, how do we teach engineers that we have to be cognizant that you know, to your point, you can write something, but what happens to it when it leaves your possession? Yeah, what happens when you, when you sell it? And um, I mean, so uh, Irina and I were just talking about this in the car on the way up, about the, the Chrome extensions that were sold and then used for uh, purposes that the uh, original developer wasn't, wasn't intending or aware of. Uh, so, I mean, cautionary tales help, but then that doesn't fully solve the problem because you still have to know, what do I do about it, right? Um, are there any steps I can take to prevent it? Is there any steps that I can take to, uh, uh, to protect users? I mean, in, in some cases, what I might be able to do, just let me reference not your case, which I think is harder, but the case I'm thinking about with the, with the Chrome browser ex extensions, saying if I, if I can at least notify my users, the people who have purchased this, when I sell the thing and say, all right, I'm handing this off to a third party, I cannot vouch for what they will or won't do with it, so if you're concerned about it, you might want to delete this, or you might want to uh, inspect the, the new owner's uh, 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 privacy policies and reputation. So um, I think that has to be addressed partly on a case-by-case -case basis, but then there might be some institutional things that need to evolve uh, to make these problems more tractable. Right. How do you make that enforceable? Yeah, exactly. Uh, one of the biggest things in software in general, not as an app developer, so to speak, but uh, that threatens innovation or affects it, um, is also, and maybe ethics comes in here, but with patents and patent trolls, and uh, you know, kind of what he's saying, and you know, how do you make a license? How is your software used? But um, in a way, it could threaten the ethical use of software as well uh, when patent you know, trolls come in and scare people away from using software for good or, or whatever. So that, that's a big issue in software in general. It's one of our most powerful issues right now is what happens with uh, software patents in general. Should they be valid? Should they be, you know, and then, then the trolls that are making money off of them and, and how they go about that. So. Right. And I think part of uh, what's true there, and it's what's true with a lot of the issues that we're talking about, is that um, because of the youth of this community, um, in terms of you know, its, its place in, um, uh, in, in, the, in the public sphere, right now a lot of people are just sort of doing ad hoc kind of solutions and one-off kind of responses that aren't coordinated uh, with the community at large. And so uh, the question there, we have to be able to involve all of the stakeholders uh, on, on the legal side, on the, uh, on the corporate side, on the uh, developer side, and figure out solutions that can be implemented more broadly. Because I think uh, uh, many of us are just sort of trying to play catch up um, to, the, to the problem. So I'd like to ask Laura Berger to just give us her thoughts on this after we heard from the FTC earlier, just uh, to reflect back on this. 
Sure, I think this has been an excellent discussion and it's really given an opportunity to go a step beyond what do you need to do to stay on the right side of the law as you're developing a single app and think more broadly about what is the direction that your profession should take to make all of these issues easier to address. So many of the things I heard from all of you were, we have so many practical hurdles to achieving compliance. We're working with partners we don't know well. We're accepting tools that you know, are cumbersome to us sometimes and, and hard for us to um, feel that assurance that we need. So this is a really excellent discussion in, in, moving, in moving forward to address some of those issues. I would just add briefly that um, there was a slide up there earlier sort of pointing out that something like 81% of the apps out there, you know, are whatever ethical problems they have are not deliberate. They're not, they're not willful, right? So there's a lot of goodwill. Uh, there's a strong majority of goodwill to make apps that, uh, that don't hurt users. Uh, and then the question is just how do we empower the community to actually uh, have that goodwill realized in the products? and in the structures that those products uh, um, uh, rely upon. Um, thank you for this conversation. Uh, actually, I want to share some kind of frustration about this topic. A um, uh, few years ago, I was the top manager of a company which uh, making the, one of the biggest poker application for App Store and the, in top grossing for, from very beginning for a few years. So it's a lot of money. And I want to say, you know, I'm from Russia. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's uh, a lot of enthusiasm to make great apps, to make, uh, you know, to be the good programmers. And uh, all this enthusiasm, when, we, when I come to this company, for example, I hire uh, around 15 guys in one month, mm -hmm. the best from my uh, home city, because I have resources to make so. And because I'm, I'm sorry, I'm having a little. Can you speak just a little bit louder? I missed the last part. Oh, so oh, you have sorry. the so 15 guys. When I when I start to be the top manager of this company, I have resources to hire guys and uh, you know big salaries, and we are so enthusiastic about making things. And you know it's it's kind of shift because uh, now you have resources and you can be bad guy because you you programming, you're making uh, you know cool instruments for other people, and actually these people making a casino, <laughs> finally, uh, and it's, 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 really, it's really, for me, it's uh, a lot of frustration after this, so after one year, I quit, but uh, still all my, uh, you know, uh, people capital still working in this area, mm -hmm. and it feels so strange because I really can't communicate and uh, um, describe why it's not so good idea, actually, because, you know, uh, from my point of view, the biggest actually mobile company in Russia, they produce social games, which nothing about social, in, at, on social by design, and poker and casino. Uh, ouch. So, so for me, the way out is just quit and trying to make useful application, but actually there are, it's hard to communicate with people who uh, have a big salary now and can now realize capabilities and can be creative and can, you know, making marketing in America and uh, wow, we are a corporation. Um, so thank you to pop up this question. Sure, yeah. And, and I think that's the challenge is to, to build uh, an ethical infrastructure into the community that actually allows developers to, to uh, express their, their talents and their creativity and their innovation um, uh, in a way that uh, doesn't require them to compromise uh, their sense of themselves as moral persons. And so it's interesting, this is really an international issue because we have a developer from Russia who's coming from Hong Kong to the conference and a, really a worldwide app market Uh, <clears throat> to me, it seems like um, ethics um, often comes from also good leadership. And uh, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are about, you know, when you look at the leadership of the government in terms of what's happening with NSA and rolling back net neutrality rules, you know, what, what does that say about ethics and how, um, uh, just your opinions on that. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that's, that's really important. You know, I teach, 
I teach undergraduate ethics to, to students, just, you know, not just engineers, but all kinds of students. And one of the most profound problems that I face is just the cynicism that comes built in when they say, well, look, this is the society I'm entering into. Are you kidding me? Ethics? Really? Really? Right? And so I spend a quarter trying to undo that sort of cynicism. And, you know, in the short time I have, I certainly can't do that. And, 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 and you're all adults with your own, um, you know, moral worldviews. Uh, that have matured and, and, and not, you know, young students who are just thinking about this for the first time. But what I want to say is that um, if we think about ethics not as something external, where the signals, the bar, is set from, from uh, external authorities, but if we think about ethics as something internal, something from within, something that, that um, we need in order to, to be enthusiastic and, and resilient and uh, connected with others, then it becomes much easier to, uh, to be shielded from the cynicism that when we look outside us and we think, oh my God, if, you know, if our political leaders are behaving uh, morally like toddlers, you know, why should I expect anything more of myself? So I think it's a question of whether you see ethics as something that is imposed on you from the outside or something that uh, comes from something within. Not to get too squishy and touchy-feely about it. All right, thank you all for your attention and interest in this. We're going to stop now so that we get a nice break um, so you can get some fresh air before we pick up again at 2. And thank you very much, Shannon. For thank this. you. Thank you. And please, if you, have, if you have any thoughts, questions, suggestions, any answers to the questions that I proposed, please just send me stuff. I don't care how full my email box gets. I'll, I'll, do, I'll deal with it. Thanks.